We all know that Chuck Yeager was the first to fly through the sound barrier and reach Mach 1.06 on October 14th of 1947. But who was the first to fly to Mach 2? That's the story we're looking at today on Vintage Space on location in an old D News studio. To call flying faster than the speed of sound breaking the sound barrier is a bit of a misnomer. There isn't actually a physical barrier at the speed of sound in the sky. Instead, it's the pressure of the air molecules building up in front of an airplane that creates the difficult environment to fly through. But there isn't the same barrier with every Mach number. It's only Mach 1 that has this so-called barrier in the sky. And once Chuck Yeager broke it in 1947, it became something that pilots were doing routinely. But Mach 2 remained a bit of a challenge for years afterwards. Though this this one was not an engineering challenge, this was really more of a psychological challenge, as well as a bit of a design challenge. Aircraft engineers had to build an aircraft that could actually fly Mach 2. In 1953, there were two aircraft up to the challenge, though only just barely. One was the Douglas D-558-2, also called the Skylancer. The other was the Bell X-1A, a slightly elongated version of the Bell X-1 in which Jaeger broke the sound barrier, designed to hold a little bit more fuel and fly a little bit faster. And both of these aircraft had two very different pilots. Jaeger, having flown the X-1, was also the lead pilot flying the X-1A and was really hoping to become the first man to fly at Mach 2. But he wasn't involved with Skylancer. One of this plane's main pilots was Scott Crossfield, a formal naval aviator who was then flying for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, the precursor organization to NASA. Crossfield was determined that he could take the Douglas aircraft to Mach 2 and he really wanted to beat Jaeger to the punch. But because Crossfield was an NACA pilot, he was not in the business of setting records like Jaeger was as an Air Force pilot. Instead, it was Crossfield's job to fly engineering flights and return engineering data that would ultimately lead to building better aircraft. So Crossfield came up with a little bit of a devious plan to circumvent the problem he was having. He actually appealed directly to the Navy's liaison at Edwards Air Force Base to see if he couldn't make one single run at Mach 2 in the Skylancer. It was a bold move that could have been professionally disastrous, but it paid off. Crossfield was given clearance from the head of the NACA, Hugh Dryden, to make a single run at Mach 2 in the Skylancer. It became a race between these two pilots of who was going to be able to break Mach 2 first, and Crossfield pulled out all the stops when he had his run at it on November 20th of 1953. He worked with his engineers to get every last ounce of speed out of the aircraft that he could possibly manage, including cold soaking the plane, which means to let liquid oxygen, super cold liquid oxygen, sit inside the tanks and stretch it out to get just a little bit more fuel into the tanks. It all worked. Crossfield managed to break Mach 2, but only just. He hit a top speed of Mach 2.006. This is actually a really interesting story that involves some really interesting characters, and it's a story that I get into in a little bit more detail in my brand new book, Breaking the Chains of Gravity, which is coming out in the UK on October 22nd and in the United States and Canada on January 12th. So if you want to know more about that story, be sure to check out the book when it's available in your region. And if you want to know more about the story or have questions about it now, leave me comments below and also your ideas and questions for future episodes. Follow me on Twitter as AST Vintage Space for more Vintage Space goodness every single day of the week. And with two episodes going up every single week, usually Tuesdays and Fridays when my schedule permits, subscribe right here so you never miss an episode.